to everyone. Thank you. And much. it's uh, good to see you all this morning. And it's especially good to see Vinisha uh, this morning, Vinisha Stanley, who joins us from India, adding to our cosmopolitan mix within our fellowship. I'm sure many of you will want to have a chat to Vinisha and welcome her uh, after the, the service this morning, but if not, then I believe Vinisha is also coming on the picnic uh, which follows the service this morning at Page Park. So you're all welcome to join us with that. Uh, just come along with your um, the food and something to sit on and we'll have a great time. I've made a lemon drizzle cake. I'm sure we'll look forward to that. Um, some news about people. Um, our thoughts and prayers continue with those who have recently been bereaved. Um, Esme Lucas, who was a member of our lunch club, her funeral service will be held on Wednesday the 30th of August at Staple Hill Methodist Church following which there will be a committal at um, Mangotsfield Cemetery. Um, we think of Yvonne Faulkner's family as well. The details of her funeral service are yet to be confirmed, but we will let you know that as soon as possible. Um, Colin, as he prepares for the funeral of his uncle Dennis, and, and Catherine Reed, who has been bereaved of her brother over the past few days. Please continue to support our friends at this time. Peter Russell and Joyce Lear, I believe, remain in hospital at the moment. We'll be thinking of them. But Claire Blowers is now home from hospital, and that's good news, isn't it? And on a, a happier note, um, it's Bev's 50th birthday <laughs> on Wednesday. Paul and this church have become grandparents over this uh, past few days with the, uh, the safe arrival of Xavier, son of Claire and Steve. So that's good news. And Bill and Frieda, um, don't believe Bill and Frieda are able to celebrate with us at the moment, but they will be celebrating their 67th wedding anniversary today. I've got that wrong, it's Friday. Friday. Friday, okay. Last Friday. Sorry, last Friday. Yeah, last Friday. Last Friday. <laughs> Just make sure we get that one. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you very much to Linda for the flowers on the, the altar table today. Uh, they, it would have been Linda and Jim's first wedding anniversary. So we are thankful for the flowers today. It's the best of all. Thank you very much, Paul, for those announcements, despite the interruptions. Yeah. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Right, we're going to sing a song to begin with, and it's song number 279, if you're using the songbook, 279. <laughs> to God be the glory, great things he hath done, so loved he the world that he gave us his son, He yielded his life and atonement for sin, and opened the life gate that all may go in. And the chorus of this song says, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. And that's what we're doing as we sing, isn't it? We've come into this place, we've gathered together to worship and praise him. And we can do that right at the beginning of our service with this song. So let's stand and we'll sing together, please. <laughs>
Today we are finishing our mini series on the book of Ruth. Have you enjoyed it? Yeah. Yes. yes. Um, and so today, the last week of the book of Ruth, I am going to attempt to cover two chapters to finish off the story. Okay, now, although we have had quite long Bible readings the last two weeks. I thought two chapters was just taking it a step too far, okay? And also I do know there's a certain event happening in a little while that some of you might, might want to nip out early for, okay? So um, I'm going to summarise the story and then Tash is going to just read a few verses of chapter four for us. So I don't know, Tash, do you want to come and be ready? Is that all right? Um, and then, um, so this is the story so far. The story of Ruth is really about two women, Ruth and Naomi, and um, we start not with Ruth at the beginning, but with Naomi, and there is famine in her homeland, so she leaves um, her homeland with her family and goes to the nearby country of Moab. Not okay, if she goes to Moab with her family and life was full of ups and downs, first of all her husband died, oh. then her two sons marry local Moabite women, hey. uh, but then they die as well, the sons, uh, and there's all these ups and downs for Naomi and life was quite difficult and so three widows were left, Naomi and her two daughters-in-law Orpah and Ruth. And so Naomi decides to go back to Bethlehem, where she came from, and Ruth decides to stay with her mother-in-law. Uh, on her return, she tells all of her old friends that she feels God has made her life bitter. She is not very happy at all, and she really blames God for it all. She left Bethlehem with such high hopes, but she's returned a bitter, childless widow. But Ruth, her daughter-in-law, has stayed with her. Life goes on and Ruth goes to the fields to pick up any leftover harvest uh, and that's the only way that two widows could support themselves at that time. And then she finds out that the owner of the field is actually a relative of her mother-in-law, Naomi. And it was customary for the nearest male relative of a widow to buy the dead uh, uh, husband's estate and also look after the dead man's widow. Uh, the male relative was known as the guardian redeemer. And to cut a long story short, which hopefully I have, okay, Boaz, the, the owner of the field and the relative of Naomi, agrees to act as Ruth's guardian redeemer. And Tash picks up the story at verse nine of chapter four. <coughs> so this is Ruth, chapter four, verses nine, to the end of 12. Then Boaz announced to the elders and to all the people, Today you are witnesses that I have bought from Naomi all of the property of Elimelech, Kilian, and Marlon. I have also acquired Ruth the Moab, Marlon's widow, as my wife, in order to maintain the name of the dead with his property, so that his name will not disappear from among his family or from his hometown. Today you are witnesses. Then the elders and all the people at the gate said, We are witnesses. May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your home like Rachel and Leah, who together built up the family of Israel. May you have standing in Ephrata and be famous in Bethlehem. Through the offspring the Lord gives you by this young woman, may your family be like that of Perez, who Tamar bore to Judah. Amen. Thank you very much. I'm sure Tash is glad that she didn't have to read the whole of the two chapters, but there were still some quite difficult words there, weren't there? So thank you very much. So Boaz marries Ruth, acquiring all of Naomi's family estate, and thus ensuring security for both Naomi and Ruth. And they all live happily ever after. Ruth and Boaz have a son, they call him Obed, who grows up to be King David's grandfather. Now, two weeks ago, on Sunday, we talked about sadness a lot, didn't we? As the family experienced lots of ups and downs. And then last week, we talked about seeds, as Ruth participated in the harvest. And today is entitled Sandals. So we've had sadness, seeds, today is sandals. 
Now, we haven't read the whole of chapter three or four, and the bit that Tasha read didn't mention sandals, so you'll have to go looking yourself for where it mentions, mentions sandals and where that comes from. But much of the book of Ruth has been about sadness, but today we get to the happy ending, and I'm sure we'll all be pleased about that. So we're going to sing a song. It's called number 875. Jesus put this song into our hearts. It's a song of joy that no one can take away. Jesus put this song into our hearts. And Ruth and Naomi had a happy ending. We too will have a happy ending if we trust in God. So we're going to stand up and sing his praise just now with this song. Thank you. Like magic, but in fact, there is a natural. 
natural explanation for it, um, of course. Um, and that's because, uh, shall I tell you, very oh, briefly yes. in one sentence, one sentence. Well, you got a side I've got a longer explanation if you want it afterwards. But what's right is that when you, when you rub the balloon against something, okay, the friction transfers the electrons onto the balloon, making the balloon negatively charged. And then when you put it on the wall, it's meant to repel the electrons in the wall, and then it sticks because the wall is positively charged. Oh. <laughs> That's all right in theory, in practice it didn't work. Okay, so there are invisible forces holding that balloon, uh, you know, holding the hair on Josh's head to the balloon. There were invisible forces, you saw that that much, didn't you? There were invisible forces. And the reason I wanted to show you that today is that I want to talk about invisible forces that hold people together. Uh, because in a family, we just sang about that in our song, in a family there are invisible forces that hold us together, isn't there? There's invisible forces, maybe things like love and care and also prayer hold a family together, those invisible forces. But also as a church, we're a bit like a family, aren't we? Yeah. A church here, the Salvation Army at Staple Hill, uh, and there's invisible forces that hold us together too. Again, things like love and prayer and care hold a church together and hold us together in the Salvation Army Staple Hill. In Philippians chapter 2, it puts it like this. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. And so every single one of us here in this room is a member of our church. Even if you haven't formally become a member, you're part of our church just because you are here. Uh, and we also have members of our church who you could call invisible because we don't see them in person, but they are watching and you're joining us now online, I know. And as a church, we have invisible forces that hold us together. But just like the balloon, where you have to keep rubbing it on Josh's hair or, or on Margaret's cardigan, it needs a bit of work sometimes. It needs a bit of work, those invisible forces. And each one of us has a part to play. We need to care and love for each other. We need to be like-minded, working towards the same goal, even when we have differences of opinions. We all need to work to get those <coughs> invisible forces and to help those invisible forces hold us together. And not just rely on somebody else to do it. We've all got a part to play. Today we're concluding our series on Ruth, and today we see how there are invisible forces within that community in Bethlehem that ultimately ensure a happy ending. We'll come back to that a little later if you're still here and you haven't gone out to watch the football. <laughs> okay, so uh, we're going to sing a song, and while we sing this song, we're going to take up the offering. It's number 483 in the songbook. 483. When I was lost, you came and rescued me. Reached down into the pit and lifted me. Ruth and Naomi needed lifting and, no, uh, uh, and they needed rescuing. And Boaz was their guardian redeemer. And we'll talk about that a bit later. But really, that's what the song talks about as well. So we'll stand, we'll take up the offering, and we'll sing this through. Thank you.
we're going to listen to the piece from the background. It's been waiting to do this process last week. So, thank you. Father, as we lay before you our financial offering, we give you all that we are and everything that you have entrusted to us. Come and bless these gifts for the sake of your kingdom and glory. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Father. What is uh, good morning to you. Good morning. Uh, we missed being with you all uh, last week, but we, we, the band, had a great time <coughs> at Western Superman in a spiritual sense, uh, in the meeting uh, led by Hilton, but also in an outreach sense, being able to play on the seafront to hundreds of people uh, as they walked past and many conversations and connections uh, were made. So the band rehearsed a lot of music to play last weekend. We didn't get to play it all because we stopped just before the rain came. Um, and one of those pieces that we didn't play was this one, Be Thou My Vision. Um, and I thought it was a good piece to play because we practiced it. But then I saw uh, where Nicola had placed us in the meeting after the song we've just sung about being lost. Uh, we rejoice in the fact that we're, we're not lost, but we still need someone to be a vision and somebody uh, to guide us. So I do hope you enjoy uh, this piece this morning. Be that my vision.
we're going to have a time of prayer now. Thank you, Andy, for helping us in our worship this morning. As we thought earlier about the invisible forces that hold our families and church together, we're going to pray for that just now. So shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning and we pray for our families. We spend a moment silently bringing our families before you now and praying for specific situations and people. Lord, we pray for our families. Hold us together in love and perseverance so that we may bring joy to you and to each other. Heavenly Father, we also want to pray for our church. We spend a moment silently bringing our church before you now and praying for specific situations and people. Dear Lord, we pray for our church. Hold us together in love and compassion so that we may bring joy to you and to each other. Heavenly Father, we also want to pray for other Christians uh, in this town, but also throughout the world. We spend a moment silently bringing the church universal before you now and praying for specific situations and people. We pray for Christians throughout the world. Hold us together in faith and unity so that we may bring joy to you and to each other. And Father, as we think and reflect on the story of Ruth and Naomi, we pray for those invisible forces that are present in our world, those invisible good forces. But we also realise and pray that you will provide us with your invisible spirit Hold him close to us too, now and forever. We ask it in your name. Amen. Amen. And we're going to continue in that reflective mode as we sing song number 353. Be still for the presence of the Lord. The Holy One is here. Come back before him now with reverence and fear. In him no sin is found. We stand on holy ground. Be still for the presence of the Lord. The Holy One is here. And the third verse goes on to talk about the power of the Lord moving in this place. This isn't our building, is it? This building is used for loads of different things throughout the week. But on a Sunday morning, it's our church, isn't it? It's our place of worship. And uh, we come before him in this place and we feel that power moving uh, as we sing this song. So we'll stay sitting there and we'll sing it. Thank you.
over the last couple of weeks that life is full of ups and downs and many members of our church have experienced difficult times in recent days with bereavement and illness but we know that you continue to walk beside us and you give us the power that we need to keep going for our happy ending and so we just pray that you'll be with us now as we continue to look at the story of Ruth and Naomi and listen to your voice. We ask this in your name. Amen. Amen. So we're going to look at those two chapters and it is quite a big chunk of the book but don't worry I'm not going to talk for ages because I appreciate that some people want to see something or listen to something in their earphones. Um, and also we've got a picnic to go to. Uh, so we're going to look just now uh, at the story of Ruth. A little bit of a summary really because all the best stories start with once upon a time, don't they? And that's what we've got. Oh, okay. Excellent. All the best stories start with once upon a time and finish with... They lived happily ever after. And that is what's certainly true of the story of Ruth and Naomi. Although this is no fairy story, this actually happened. It's a true story. Once upon a time, there was a woman called Naomi. And they all lived happily ever after. Oh. Ruth, her daughter-in-law, married Boaz and had a son, which made Naomi a proud grandma. But we're going way too fast, okay? Because we've got to the end of the story already. It's not that short, all right? So we're just going to rewind a little bit, okay? Because the first part of the book of Ruth, we looked at two weeks ago, is quite depressing. And we were a little bit depressed, weren't we? Okay, it's a bit depressing. It's full of ups and downs, is Naomi's life, especially. Uh, and it seems that quite often the downs took over from the ups, didn't it? And over the last couple of weeks, we have looked at that sadness and reflected on the ups and downs of our own lives. But now we're at the end of the story and it's time to concentrate on the happily ever after. Thank goodness I hear you say, we need some cheering up. We do. <laughs> and we've gone from sadness to seeds to sandals. Check out chapter four for where that comes in. Okay. But the magic of this story, though, happened in between the once upon a time and the happily ever after. Because there were two pieces of magic, really, because it's those two invisible forces. <laughs> so first of all, we've got invisible force number one. Uh, let's go back. Ruth and Naomi have returned from Bethlehem quite broken. They've experienced sadness, they've experienced grief and disaster. And now Ruth and Naomi are left as two widows without money and without much hope. But invisible force number one comes into play. And it's that invisible force that holds people together. We talked about it earlier when we looked at our balloon. The invisible force that exists in families, in churches, and even in communities. In Naomi's story, the first invisible source is actually Ruth. It's the force, the invisible force between Ruth and Naomi. Because despite Naomi's insistence that Ruth should return to her own hometown, Ruth is determined to stay with Naomi. She will not leave Naomi, her mother, in law. There is an invisible force that exists between Ruth and Naomi. Now what that invisible force is, I'm not quite sure. Whether it's a sense of duty or a sense of love or something else, it doesn't really matter. Uh, the important thing is that Ruth will not leave Naomi, and that gives Naomi hope. Let's put ourselves in Naomi's shoes for a minute. She'd lost everything, hadn't she? And Ruth was the one thing that gave her hope and gave her something to look forward to. Throughout this story, things were often difficult for Naomi, but how much more difficult would they have been if she'd been on her own and if she had not had Ruth? beside her. Ruth really is an encouragement, a comfort, a companion and a practical helper. Naomi couldn't do it without her. There was this invisible force that held Naomi and Ruth together. And I am reminded here of something we talked about, uh, the fact that we often have 
Ruth's in our lives. We've got a Ruth here this morning. But I don't mean people actually called Ruth, although Ruth is lovely. Okay? It's Ruth. The, we have Ruth's in our lives, don't we? People who help us, who stay beside us, who have that invisible force with us. People who seem to be joined to us. People who have stayed with us in the ups and downs of life. People who've been encouragers, comforters, companions, and practical helpers to us. And so again this morning, I will challenge you to make sure that you thank those people this week. Do it today if they're here. Thank those Ruths, Ruths, I'm not sure how you say Ruths in people, but, but thank those Ruths in your life. Uh, thank them, but also thank God for them, because they give us hope, don't they, those people? But also we need to make sure that we play our part as Ruth sometimes. Maybe God is calling us to be a Ruth to somebody else. We too need to be encouragers, comforters, companions and practical helpers to other people. And maybe God is telling you to be that just now to somebody uh, that you know. So the first invisible force is between Ruth and Naomi, and that's a personal, individual invisible force between two people. Our second invisible force um, is more of a group effort, uh, more corporate, more community-based. Because when Naomi returns to Bethlehem, there is an invisible force between Naomi and the community. Because at the end of chapter one, we read that the whole town was stirred because of them. I don't think they were just being nosy or being a bit curious. They were welcoming Naomi back. I think I've got that. Oh, yeah, there is. They were welcoming Naomi back. And then the community's welfare and benefit system comes into play because Ruth and Naomi, poor widows with no means of income, are given the opportunity to glean in the harvest fields. That's a lovely word, isn't it? It's just it's one of those words that's nice to say. Um, it, it's all about God's law, and God's law can be found in Leviticus, um, where it states that at the time of harvest, farmers shouldn't gather 100% of their crops, but they should leave a portion of their crops for the poor to collect. God wants communities to care for each other providing for people who are struggling. God doesn't want anyone to go without, so that's why in his law he said that in Leviticus. It's that invisible force that he wants to happen in communities, people helping each other and supporting each other. God wants us to care for each other. Now, interestingly, in our extra slice group this week, we had a conversation about this gleaning um, and about the way of giving to the poor uh, the way that, you know, by them working alongside the harvesters, harvesters, it was quite an empowering thing for those people that were struggling. It wasn't just a handout. They were actually working alongside the other people harvesting to collect their gleaning. It wasn't just a handout. And maybe that's better than the way benefits or charity can often work today. And that might be a challenge to us about how we can empower people uh, who are struggling. Allowing the poor to glean in the fields is what God intended to care for each other. And that's the invisible force that is at work in communities. And so we need to apply God's law to life today. Now we may not be able to leave some crops when we're harvesting. Although some of you I know have got crops in your garden. Okay, uh, But in what ways can we ensure that people in our community are provided for? Are we caring for those who are struggling as God would want us to? God wants us to work at that invisible force that holds communities together. Now back with Ruth, we see that community invisible force extended by the custom of a close relative taking on a widow, ensuring that she had income and security. And in comes Boaz into our story, who acted as Ruth's guardian redeemer. Now this was another God-given custom. Close male relatives would take care of widows, providing for them, marrying them, giving them security. Another way that the community was held together with invisible forces. Now as a church, we are blessed to be part of the Staple Hill 
community. And I think I can say that we are one of the invisible forces that hold the Staple Hill community together. But we always need to make sure that we're playing our part in a relevant way. And we're not just doing what we've always done. We need to be authentically playing our part. We need to be shining God's light in Staple Hill, in our part of God's world. We need to be making sure that we're empowering people and not just handing out things. And as we move back into our building, there will be even more opportunities for us to do that. But it isn't just in our building. It's in the community itself, isn't it? Often as individuals living our lives on the front line as God wants us to, that's where the invisible force in our community comes in. And we can all play a part at working at that invisible force. There's lots of invisible forces at work in Ruth's story though. Ruth and Naomi, we had first, then we have community invisible force, welcoming, when she wel the people welcomed them back, the gleaning and the guardian redeemer. But there's something else invisible happening here, and it's not just invisible, but invincible. Ooh. Get what I did there? Now, as we read through the book of Ruth, as we live through the ups and downs of Naomi's life, the invisible and invincible force is God himself. God is the force that holds it all together. He is the glue that keeps it from falling apart. He is the invisible, invincible force. Now, even though Naomi and her husband tried to work things out on their own by moving to another country, God remained with Naomi looking after her, giving her Ruth as her hope, providing for her practical needs in the harvest, ensuring Boaz was there to give her long-term security, ensuring ultimately a happy ending. And that happy ending was so much more than just a wedding. At the end of the book, we're told that Ruth and Boaz's son, who was called Obed, he was the father of Jesse, who was the father of David, the David who killed Goliath, the David who became the greatest king of Israel. And what's more, if we keep following the generations down, we get to Jesus himself. When we started to read the book of Ruth, it seemed like a story about two insignificant women. But if we zoom out, they had a part to play in God's plan to save the world. If we looked at Matthew chapter 1, and you can do that later on your own if you want to, in Matthew chapter 1, the genealogy of Jesus is outlined, all the generations, the father, then the father, then the father, until we get to Joseph, Jesus' father. The genealogy of Jesus is outlined, and Ruth is listed there in Matthew chapter 1 as one of Jesus' ancestors. And remember, Ruth was a woman, I'm stating the obvious, but she was also a foreigner. She wasn't a Jew, and yet she is listed in the genealogy of Jesus. She had a place in the story of Jesus, God's invisible, invincible force at work. And this invincible God is interested in the ups and downs of our lives too. We might feel unimportant and insignificant but he's interested in us like he was interested in Ruth and Naomi he's interested in our ups and downs he's the invincible invisible force that holds things together he gives us hope he is our encourager comforter companion and practical helper and we can trust him through our ups and downs and we know we'll have a happy ending. We can trust him through our ups and downs, but it's so much more than that. Because Jesus is our redeemer. Boaz was the guardian redeemer. That meant that he took on the property of the husband. And he gave them security, a long-term security. Well, Jesus is our redeemer. He saves us and gives us long-term security. In fact, eternal security. 
and us, unimportant and in insignificant as we may feel, we have a place in the Jesus story too. Even when we feel unimportant, even when we feel like there's, we've got nothing to give, we have a place in Jesus' story. God doesn't see us as insignificant. He sees us as special and important. We can trust in God, our invisible, invincible force. We can trust him to save us. We can trust him to provide for us. We can trust him to encourage us. We can trust him to comfort us. We can trust him to protect us. We can trust him to guide us. He is our companion, ever present, and our practical helper too. Through all of our lives, ups and downs. Isn't it great that we've got to a happy ending? Isn't it great that we can trust in God in that way? Some of you might be going through difficult times. We've talked about them a lot over the last two weeks. And you need to be encouraged by this message. That God is the invincible, invisible force that holds communities together, holds our church together, holds us together. He saves us and redeems us and is our ever-present companion. We're going to use a chorus. The words are, I'm in his hands. Whatever the future holds, I'm in his hands. The days I cannot see have all been planned for me. His way is best, you see. I'm in his hands. We're going to stay sitting down and we'll sing this through a couple of times, Mark. Does it work like that? We'll sing it through a couple of times. Whatever happens with the music, we'll sing it through. Uh, but as we sing, you know, they're not just words. We're really appreciating that God is our invincible, invisible force in our lives. Thank you.
because you have, are an invisible and invincible force in our lives. You are our ever-present companion. You are our encourager, our comforter, our guide, and also our practical helper in all of life's ups and downs. For those people here that are struggling at the moment, we just pray for them. Please be an extra special encouragement to them just now and be whatever they need. But we also pray for each one of us in our church here as we have invisible forces between us. We pray that you'll help us to make a difference in our community, to be the invisible force or part of the invisible force that is the glue that holds our community together. Help us to shine your light in this place. And as we move out of this place, either going home or to the park, we pray that you'll continue to be with us as a church in our fellowship together. We ask it in your name. Amen. Amen. Now, uh, make sure on your way out to pick up a sheet, uh, even though most extra slice groups aren't meeting, I don't think, this week. Um, there's a sheet and you can use it on your own at home just to help you think a little bit more about Ruth. And if you're still a bit confused about the whole story, I put a little link on the bottom of the sheet to a nice little cartoon version on YouTube, okay, that nicely summarises the story. So if you want to look at that, make sure you pick up a sheet for just for that reason. That would be good. And after this, uh, we, we, we take until about maybe 12 until to clear up, do we? We take until about 12 to clear up. If you want to help clear up or, or go off down to the park, we'll meet there somewhere. I'm sure we'll find each other. And uh, we'll have a time of fellowship, which will be good. Mm. Right, we're going to finish with a song. And it's number 378 of the Using the Songbook. And this song has become a little bit of a theme song for our mini series on Ruth because it talks about what a faithful God had I. Because Ruth and Naomi had a faithful God, didn't they? Through life's ups and downs, he was there with them, their constant companion. So we'll stand and we'll sing together and then we'll enjoy some coffee before we <laughs>
Heavenly Father, help us to play our part to ensure that our families, our church and our community are held together by your invisible forces. Thank you that you are our invincible force, redeeming us and giving us a place in your story, now and into the future. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. 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 Amen.